Hello, good evening and welcome to this AHDB webinar on integrated pest management for field vegetables. I'm Dawn Teverson and my job is to disseminate research, uh, results of research and best practice in the field vegetable industry. On the right hand side of my slide, there's a mock control panel which you hopefully can see on your computer. If you would like to ask any questions, there is a question box. And if you can see my mouse moving here, this is the question area. So you can type a question in here and submit it to us and we will pose those questions to the speaker after the end of their presentations. So a little bit of housekeeping. Okay, so housekeeping. This evening's webinar, we have a few housekeeping rules. You can see and hear me, but we can't hear you. You have all been muted, so don't worry, because if you want to pose a question during the course of this evening's webinar, there's a question facility which I've, I've just shown you briefly, but I'll explain in, in more detail in a moment. We're timing this webinar and we'll be hoping to fish, finish at about 7.30 p.m. This webinar is being recorded so that people will be able to watch and listen again if they weren't able to join us tonight. And I'm glad to say that for those interested in basis and neuroso points, these have been applied for and you can register for them again and I'll explain more later. So, as I mentioned. Sorry. sorry, Dawn, you need to be in presentation mode. Oh, sorry. Sorry, chaps. So, on the right hand side, as I mentioned, hopefully everybody's already used to this kind of thing, but there's a mock up of the computer panel, which hopefully you can see on your computer. And as I mentioned, if you'd like to ask any questions, you can use the question box. You can see the mouse moving here, as I mentioned. Um, so you can type in the questions there and submit it to us, and we'll pose those questions to the speakers after the end of each of their presentations. And basis and neuroso points are also in here, so you can add your number there. If you can't do that or you run out of time, you can email us after the event. So onto the webinar program properly. I'm delighted to say that we have two very knowledgeable and well-known speakers here with us tonight, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions after each of their presentations. The first of our speakers is Bruce Napier. Bruce is the NIAB Vegetable and Salad Crop Specialist. He has 30 years of research and trials experience, and his current horticulture work delivers research on variety performance, crop agronomy and IPM best practice. He leads the consortium of four research organisations delivering AHDB horticulture strategic centres for field vegetables, which I manage on behalf of AHDB. So Bruce will be talking about onion and carrot variety selection and performance, the building blocks of a profitable crop. And as you can see here, Varieties are a particularly important part of an IPM strategy. Our second speaker is Rosemary Collier. Rosemary is trained as an entomologist and has worked on the pest insects of horticultural crops for many years. Her main research interest is the development and application of integrated pest management strategies for horticultural crops. She's also interested in the wider aspects of food production and consumption and in recent years has collaborated with colleagues in a range of disciplines and products and projects even associated with food and food security. So Rosemary will talk, be talking about IPM in a range of crops and helping us to see how we can fit all these pieces of the IPM jigsaw together. So now over to the first of our speakers, Bruce, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, just waiting for the uh, um, option to share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can all see that now. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, without further ado, thank you, Dawn, for the introduction. Uh, as, as Dawn mentioned, I'm the, sorry, just get my, uh, the NIAB uh, vegetable specialist. Um, I'm going to bring you some elements of the AHDB uh, Horticulture Strategic Centers for Field Vegetables uh, trial work and some other elements about um, IPM. Uh, we'll focus mainly on the onions and a bit about carrot uh, variety selection and performance, um, say the building blocks of a uh, profitable crop. Uh, for those that are not familiar with it, a brief history of the strategic centers. Um, there, sorry, just uh, no, now got me on the screen as well. Uh, just uh, that one. So the uh, it's a project is a consortium uh, led by NIAB, Avedas, PGRO, and Dutchie College, uh, and it brings together the core variety work, uh, which is obviously part of uh, IPM strategy. Uh, but there's also additional funding where we've been able to do other pieces of work to, to add to that knowledge pool. Um, and it's very much sort of driven by, by growers, uh, for growers, so that they can uh, pick projects that they're uh, keen to, to see further developments on. Um, it's not just AHDB, they play a very important part uh, funding a lot of the work, but there's also contribution from the seed companies, the chemical manufacturers and suppliers. The host farmers put a lot of work in and the steering groups also uh, contribute a huge amount of their knowledge and uh, pushing the program forward, both from BCGA, are the ones I deal with mainly, and other levy boards such as PGRO. Um, so IPM. Uh, it really is um, the building blocks of a successful uh, strategy um, and it's how you identify and, and understand what the hazards and risks are um, in growing the, the crop that you're uh, trying to uh, take to market and, and what factors can you control. Um, obviously things you can choose what variety to put in, you can control the agronomy to an extent and the timing. Um, and other such things, but there's there's also things you can't that can't be controlled, such as the weather's and I'll put unpredictable factors. I think uh, 2020 has certainly thrown a very big unpredictable factor in with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and while that doesn't sound like part of IPM, I know a lot of growers have put a lot of hard work in so managing to get staff out and and still um, grow their crops. And, and get them to market. So, um, it's a great job done there. But varieties, uh, people think it's all about disease and pest resistance um, when we talk about IPM, uh, but there is a lot more uh, to it than that. Uh, so, the onion trials, um, uh, an old couple of old pictures there, one of even people in the field talking to each other at less than two meters apart. Uh, but the BOPA steering group. Uh, leads these trials and um, since 2000 we've actually tested over 333 drilled onion varieties and 50 set varieties as well um, and it's not just about the numbers it's it's really showing uh, I think Dawn mentioned that I've 30 years at NIAB and, and 15 of those have been in the veg industry um, 15 years ago we would have seen one maybe two different red onion varieties and now, uh, as you can see there, we've got a, a dozen or so sort of um, tray of each from two different trials. Uh, there's a lot of new material coming through, a lot of effort um, that the seed companies are putting in to bring you new varieties um, into the mix. Um, and thanks again to our host farmers who, who help us do this trial work at um, Ricks, Rakers and, and at G's. So onion uh, variety selection, uh, as the screen says, use the right onion. Uh, I think that was for cooking, but it was uh, something I could find on the internet. It's not just about choosing the best variety. Um, it's always a good idea to, to spread the risk. So grow, select more than one variety and look at the, the timings of those when they're going to mature to st stagger your harvest season. Um, 
and that may even include overwintered onions and, and sets to uh, uh, spread, sort of really spread the, the season to its maximum um, speed of emergence. I'll talk a wee bit more about that uh, later, um, but but the, that's obviously critical in avoiding damping off. Um, we've certainly had some cold springs uh, where yeah people have managed to get onto the, the land and drill their crops, but then being caught out by uh, cold, damp weather. Um, and so having uh, rapid emergence is important there. Foliage habit and leaf waxiness are very important as well. I suspect uh, I may be straying slightly onto Rosemary's territory, so I won't say too much, but um, on leaf waxiness, uh, thrips certainly like to strip the, the leaf wax off, uh, and that then makes the, uh, the leaf more susceptible to disease because the, the wax being the uh, natural protection. Uh, and the foliage habit, the denser the foliage, the higher humidity, uh, the more likely that diseases sort of propagate and uh, you're less likely to get a, an active spray onto those uh, those sort of bits that are dense in the foliage. And disease resistance, well, uh, I've put e.g. mildew resistance there. Um, that's really all we've got in the onions at the moment. There's There's a lot of good work. Um, throughout the industry, uh, some on Fusarium, uh, John Clarkson at, at Warwick's doing some very good work uh, helping the seed companies try and identify resistance genes. Uh, but that's that's proving a challenge. Um, there's not a, a broad selection to, to to breed into material, and there's uh, work by uh, Steve Roberts looking at neck rot, uh, predominantly looking at seed treatments. Uh, white rot's another big issue. Um, just quickly back to the mildew resistance. It's a single gene resistance um, that was discovered from a Japanese bunching onion, and and that was bred into a, uh, um, a sort of a, a parent line. That then the seed companies, a couple of them, bought into that breeding line and have been trying to breed it into uh, commercial, commercially suitable varieties, and that's um, that's very difficult for them to do. Uh, takes time. And it's only a single gene resistance. There's there's a real worry in the industry that that may break down, and there's no second uh, defence mechanism. Uh, storage potential is also important. Uh, a lot of the soil-borne diseases don't really show up until later in the season, um, and uh, or even in storage. So you may think you've got got a good crop into store. Uh, but it's very important to sort of monitor that uh, throughout storage, uh, maybe using hot boxing and other techniques to uh, see what uh, you've got um, disease wise in store and, and react to that uh, quickly. Uh, and that really, some of that also comes under the onion agronomy. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of a, a grandmother sucking an egg, so you've got a picture of a snake. Um, uh, trying to swallow an egg, which uh, is probably more successful than uh, they give it credit to. Uh, but the basic, the basics here, and as I say, you probably know a lot of this stuff, but it does no harm to, to reiterate. Uh, look at the rotations uh, for onion crops. Really, having a, a seven-year rotation is um, is sort of the minimum that most people try and achieve. Squeezing that, uh, I have seen it. Growers fall foul of that and, and think they could get away with it. Uh, 2018 was a classic year, uh, which was a very high fusarium incidence, and, and squeezing the rotation would have compounded that issue. Soil type and preparation well, you can't necessarily change your soil. You can look at your preparation techniques, and, and getting that right, uh, stale seed beds, controlling weeds is all, all uh, important to getting a good crop, especially on onions, which which don't compete very well. Seed treatments, uh, there's a lot of good work going on on seed treatments. Uh, there's new new uh, actives coming through. The biologicals are looking to uh, act as protective clo uh, coating rather than actually activity against disease themselves, maybe. Um, but AHCB has got a very good fact sheet on that, so I'm not going to um, repeat what's in that. Uh, don't bite off more than you can chew. Well, uh, when I was working in uh, cereal pathology, I'm really just reminding growers that you might get a wet spring or a, a wet period where you can't get on and spray. So 
consider how how much you can spray in a day, sort of, and, and have a manageable uh, quantity of crop that you th you think you can keep on top of. And also irrigation, obviously, uh, the same story. Uh, how much can you irrigate? How much water have you actually got access to? Monitoring, I think Rosemary will probably mention more about that uh, on the insect side of things. But as with everything, the, the weeds, the disease, and pest, you need to uh, understand and monitor uh, what what the risks are um, if you're if you're going to be able to uh, respond to them. Uh, and hot boxing, as I mentioned, and, and store monitoring is a uh, a vital part of, of maintaining your yields uh, once you've got them out of the field. Some work from this year's onion trials. I won't spend long on this because uh, we've covered it with the onion uh, open day, a virtual open day we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, but as I mentioned about the damping off, there are some varieties there listed Medusa, Fasto, Shikito. Uh, several reds, red spark, uh, some coded varieties from Hazira and Red Herald, all have good early vigour, and that that's crucial to um, getting a good start, getting good establishment, um, and then seeing what sort of uh, takes you through later into the season um, with a good mid-season vigour. Um, and you've got some some varieties there that have uh, continued. Shikito continues on its good start. Um, Maturity-wise, uh, there seems to be a, a trend towards earlier maturing varieties. Uh, they don't always uh, do very well on the heavier soils, but um, on lighter soils and sort of uh, mid-range soils, uh, those are certainly favoured. And Numbito has, has consistently uh, been in the earlier end of the slot. And as, as I mentioned before, Medusa, but there's also high bound, high bound being early varieties. Uh, but there's a lot of other uh, varieties close behind, just a few days later maturity. Um, I seem to have got uh, yeah, Shikito and, and Nation there, um, and some early reds in Ruby Star, 37219, 37222, and Red Light. Uh, storage, uh, we, we collect data on, on sprouting, but we also see um, what the cause of any rots is, uh, Fusarium tends to be one of the, the top ones, but uh, neck rot is a big issue at the moment. Uh, and bacterial rots are also an issue, and that's often uh, the bacterial rot certainly are, that bacteria tends to get in, in the field, sort of uh, in the neck. At, um, and so good drying and curing um, help that, but also a tight neck finish is important. Uh, and there's some info there from the 2020, uh, sorry, the 2019, trials, but obviously those are then stored through the winter and that data is from uh, sort of uh, March through to sort of June in 2020. Um, there's some good varieties there in ambient storage um, listed, uh, but cold storage as well. Sometimes varieties sort of outperform in, in cold storage, even if they wouldn't store in, in an ambient store. Newer varieties coming through, I think I've mentioned Nathan already. As, as a um, early maturing, uh, seems to have very good storage from the data we've got so far. Uh, promotion um, also from Syngenta coming through as uh, good yields and good storage, but but uh, later maturing. 219 mentioned it a couple of times. That that's looking good. Red Ray and Red Lander. Um, Red Lander has has some mildew tolerance, but uh, there is anecdotal evidence of, of sort of that maybe sort of breaking down. So we need to keep a, get a bit more data on that. And a coded variety there that was high yielding, but uh, I suspect isn't gonna go much further because it had a, an issue with bolters this year. And, and, and that actually, if things come up too soon, sometimes a hard April can really uh, show up bolting issues. But the financial benefits um, we're seeing differences between 30 tonnes per hectare um, between the best and worst on trials. Um, a lot of them don't have that sort of difference, maybe only 5, 10 tonnes per hectare, but the variety selection uh, does add, add up into pounds and pence when you look at it from that, that viewpoint. Fast establishment prevents losses, mildew resistance, um, less fungicides, uh, and a variety that might 
group look average, but with good disease res resistance can come good in high disease pressure years. Uh, some, and as mentioned earlier, some diseases don't show up until the produce is in storage. Uh, and that, there you can see really big differences in, in how long they'll store. Um, uh, it's onto, again, maybe slightly on Rosemary's territory, but some work Becky Howard's been doing at PGRO has been doing as part of the consortium is looking at um, cultivation timing um, to reduce uh, damage uh, in vining peas uh, from bean seed fly larvae. And, and uh, early indications are a seven day period between cultivation and drilling uh, can help reduce damage. Um, now that's that's important across a, a number of crops. Um, the bean seed fly also affects onions and leeks. Uh, particularly in leeks, the may, may drilled leek crops, uh, uh, we've seen sort of whole crop lossage uh, where where sort of the crop's been drilled too late and the bean seed fly um, have just wolfed the whole lot down a bit, a bit like cabbage stem flea beetle uh, in all seed rape. Uh, so understanding the life cycle, which um, Becky's doing that work to, to help, uh, can help us look at uh, drilling dates and other strategies to try and can control or at least escape uh, that damage. Uh, onto carrots briefly. Again, spread the risk looking at different varieties, timing and maturity to stagger the harvest season. Uh, suitability for storing is, is very important. Um, foliage habit, more open uh, habit, uh, means that more air flow through the crop, which allows, uh, sort of reduces the disease instance. Um, and looking at disease resistance, again, so, uh, John Clarkson's doing some very good work on cavity spots, but uh, that's a bit of an enigma. Uh, people have been studying it for the last 40 years plus and still uh, finding out a lot about it and uh, it still seems to be an issue in the, in the industry. So hopefully uh, the work John's doing now will, will help move things on. And, and virus in carrot crops seems to be uh, coming more and more to the, the fore as an issue with, with the loss of, of uh, insecticides and aphicides. So um, storage potential, that's that's another issue that um, whether it's better to, to store it under straw or whether to um, harvest it and then either store it in soil or, or washing it. Uh, John Birkenshaw did some very good work a few years back um, and, and the the trade-off between the, th the three was it was about equal, but I think sort of continuing to look at straw price and other things, it, it could be worth revisiting that. Uh, brick score, uh, the high sugar content uh, we did see in in twenty in his, quite a while ago now, 2010, 2011 winter, which had a very hard early frost. Uh, higher sugar content varieties suffered less. Uh, where, where uh, growers hadn't managed to get the straw on in time, uh, so it acts a bit like a natural antifreeze. Uh, the agronomy, I couldn't find a picture of a, a, a carrot on a, on a mouse trap, but that's almost carrot shaped, that piece of cheese. Uh, the same principles really as, as the onions. Look at your rotations, look at the soil type and preparation, seed treatments, um, looking at how much you can, can manage and, uh, and, and keeping constant vigilance and, and monitoring of your crops. And as I mentioned already, the storing versus harvesting uh, debate, uh, harvesting and storing debate. Um, I didn't want to cover too much on aphids and viruses because there was a, an AHDB webinar yesterday, which hopefully uh, many of you managed to uh, join in on. Uh, I'm sure it was very good. I was uh, busy elsewhere, unfortunately. Uh, so I'll watch it on catch up. Um, talk to the breeders to understand any claims they're making on resistance and, and ask them to see their evidence. And they will have a lot of evidence, hopefully, uh, so they can uh, give you confidence in, in any of those claims. And the same goes for seed treatment work, coating work and priming. Uh, talk to the, uh, the seed coating company, production companies. Uh, we did some work on priming against, seed and, uh, against BMOX and against uh, Wackill. And that was in the carrot presentation the other day. So if you've got a chance to look back at that, uh, there's more data there to look at. Uh, I mentioned about foliage erectness and um, 
trimming uh, carrot sort of uh, top sort of late in the season to, to allow air flow through the crop, uh, timing of strawing, etc. Um, and, and that's, of course, just part of the story. Um, if you've got any questions now, or well, you can save it to the end. And I think Dawn will, will hand you over to, uh, uh, to Rosemary. Thank you, Bruce. And we've got five minutes for questions now. Um, we've got a question from Andrew Cuthbertson from DEFRA, who quite rightly points out that um, DEFRA's vegging has led to the identification of pre-breeding resources containing resistance to fusarium in basal rot in onions. Um, and yeah, totally agree with that. I'm, I keep a watching brief on vegin and they've got a fantastic range of um, pre-breeding resources there. And I'm a great believer that all the resistance genes are out there. It's just a case of looking for them. Um, so that is very valuable work there. I don't know if, if Rosemary's got anything to contribute on, on vegin? Oops. Hello. Sorry, I had to turn everything on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you, Dawn. And, and yesterday, I, th I think uh, the, the potential importance of vegging was flagged up in the context of viruses. Um, and absolutely, um, yeah. Because, um, yeah, at the moment, I think several crops are um, limited in the ways that they can control aphids transmitting virus and uh, so maybe uh, some of these viruses should be future targets for uh, for the vegin project. Yeah, um, yeah AHD, I, sorry after you Bruce. No that's all right I was just going to pretty much reiterate what uh, Rosemary has said thank Andrew for reminding us about vegin and other crops have their own genetic improvement network so it's always worth seeing what they're doing it really brings research organizations together with agronomists and growers to, to sort of tackle tackle the big issues yeah i must say one of the things that came out yesterday of the discussions on uh, aphids i was with howard hines in the carrot discussions and he showed a picture of the cultivar nairobi which is what a lot of growers use next to one of the newer um varieties and certainly you know there was no testing for aphids um sorry for for viruses done there but certainly the new varieties looked incredibly healthy whereas nairobi was looking a little bit chlorotic um and that was leading people to suggest that maybe there was some virus differences some um differences in in tolerance to viruses what do you think it's a possibility. We, we've uh, uh, certainly NIAB have, have done some uh, virus work in the past and on varieties in the field, and it's very difficult to get um, a sort of representative infection across uh, a whole trial if you if you leave it to natural infection. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are differences out there, uh, and it's spotting the difference between selective feeding on a, a range of varieties in the same field and actually identifying resistance. But there's a lot of lot more tools out there for, for actually seeing the virus is present or not. Uh, and that's also important to understand. It, it may look healthy, but there might be virus in the leaf doing some yeah. damage. Uh, just on the Nairobi uh, point, um, it's a variety that served the industry well over the years. Um, on the, on the expectation that you could throw it as a wall and it wouldn't break. Uh, but there's a lot of other material coming through now that's uh, equally strong, has possibly better uniformity and other characteristics. So I think we're seeing a, a move away from Nairobi uh, as the only variety. Um, and so, yeah, being able to choose varieties on disease resistance or virus resistance is, is crucial. Um, yeah, and certainly the, the growers, this is grower led work. So we're reacting to what the growers want to do when we talk to them each autumn. And they've wanted to um, look at this breakage characteristics for, for, for the last couple of years. 
So we have got fairly consistent data on that. We've got the reports on the AHDV website for last year and at the end of the year when we get the reports in, certainly those will be on the AHDV website um, and available to all on that and all the other different strategic centre um, work we're doing. So we have another question here. What do you think is the main reason why Fusarium has become an issue as it has in the onion industry as it was less of an issue 20 years ago? So Bruce, what, what's new in the last few years that we didn't have previously? I'm going to take an easy answer on that one and say global warming. Um, but I think certainly global warming, uh, warmer summers uh, may be shifting the profile of, of fusariums that are affecting uh, the crop. I mean, certainly when I was looking at cereals, um, we used to inoculate with four different fusaria species, and you could pick out which one was dominant by the, the mean temperature of that summer. Uh, and I'm sure. Um, Let's say sort of it may be that uh, the Fusarium oxysporum sort of just uh, enjoying the warmer summers and 2018 was was a really bad year and that was a hotter summer so um, I don't think it's a selection pressure per se uh, but tighter rotations will make a difference and uh, say warmer weather will make a difference. Yeah yeah absolutely it's it's not looking good from the point of view of global warming is it that's for sure. Um, and on that kind of subject, um, we've got another question. Is there still a future for seed treatments going forward? They seem to be being revoked frequently. Um, I mean, in either of you. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's a place for them. Uh, I mean, they've, they may have to go through more stringent uh, testing. Uh, that's unfair. They've been through very stringent uh, testing, but it may be that sort of politically it's easy to uh, to dismiss some of them as being sort of dangerous. But it's understanding that uh, putting a seed treatment on is is a very small quantity of chemical, uh, highly targeted compared to to blanket spraying with with stuff later. So um, yeah, it's finding the right balance, and the, and we're also investigating. A lot of re research organisations are investigating alternatives uh, we're looking at uh, some uh, plasma treatment of uh, cold plasma treatment of, of seeds there's, there's uh, things like serenade um, and other biological seed treatment so yeah uh, one door shuts but hopefully another one one opens yeah and on the subject of seed treatments again um, we we mustn't be too much longer but um, a specific question, is there any work going on for the replacement of metalaxyl for pythium control? I think that, I think it's all in the mix, basically. Um, it, it's, yeah, uh, I, I'm not directly involved in the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of production of those, and, and uh, that's the, the, seed, uh, the ag chem companies, so uh, yes, I'm sure they're they're looking. It's just um, is there sufficient um, demand for them to, to to target that specific disease, or do they look at their existing portfolio and then see if there's beneficial effects in other crops? Yeah, and certainly is is this an opportunity, Rosemary, to mention Sector Plus? Uh, yes, absolutely. So it's one of the targets in 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 sector sector plus. Um, so, but obviously, yeah, sector plus. Um, we screen what what is obviously offered by by the companies, um, and we look at, at at new conventionals, and we also look at uh, biopesticides as well. Great. OK, well, with with that, I think that brings us nicely into Rosemary Collier's pres presentation. So over to you, Rosemary. OK, thank you. Oops. OK, many thanks, Dawn. Uh, good evening, everybody from a, a very dark Wellsbourne. Um, and this is the latest I've been in the office uh, for some some months. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is um, a, a sort of run through of some of the things that we've been doing uh, towards um, integrated pest management in field vegetable and salad crops. And in terms of pests, I'm talking about them really in the sense of insects rather than the uh, broader concept. Um, so what's IPM and why do we need it? Um, so there are lots and lots of definitions of IPM, um, but I quite like this one, which says that it's a decision-based process involving coordinated use of multiple tactics for optimising the control of all classes of pests in an ecologically and economically sound manner. So I'm immediately leaving that de definition because I'm only going to talk about insects um, tonight. So why do we need IPM? And, and I think we, we need it now even more than, than ever. Um, firstly, because of the, the, the diminishing number of pesticides available, um, because of in increasing incidence of pesticide resistance. And in the UK, that's particularly to pyrethroids at the moment. Um, because of the need to uh, protect biodiversity and make it work for us as well, um, and because of the perceived impacts um, of IPM on beneficial impacts on human health. Um, so there are a number of ways of, of, of sort of describing IPM. Um, and at the moment, I'm quite keen on this IPM uh, pyramid. Um, and um, the, the theory behind it is if, there's, if you're planning to uh, grow a crop, um, then you should start at the bottom of the pyramid um, and look at the range of agronomic practices available to you um, on the basis that you, you, if possible, select the ones that will help you to prevent a pest infestation. And then once you've got the crop in the ground, um, then it's very helpful to know what's going on in terms of the arrival of, of various pests. So this is where decision support and monitoring and forecasting systems become important. And then if you have got pests, um, then there are a number of approaches to control. Um, there might be options for uh, mechanical, physical or natural control. Um, again, there might be options for biological control, which could be um, biopesticides or introduced predators. And then at the top of the pyramid, we've got chemical control. And again, the theory is that you only apply the, the chemical control uh, when absolutely necessary. Um, when you've done everything else you can um, to avoid um, a pest infestation. So IPM is, is practiced um, in, in, and best practiced in greenhouses. Um, and I think the reason behind this is, is well, there are several. Um, first of all, um, in tomato, uh, there are valuable non-targets that you don't want to uh, knock off with your insecticides. So pollinators, bumblebees. Um, historically, there have been um, important incidences of insecticide resistance. Again, a loss, lack of selective insecticides. Um, and then it's a contained crop. So it's a simpler system. Um, the environment's controlled. Um, it's got walls and that makes biocontrol easier. And obviously, um, greenhouse crops are usually much higher value crops per hectare. And if you're interested in, in hearing more about the development of IPM strategies in greenhouses, then do listen to Rob Jacobson talk um, that he gave yesterday at the APHIS Day, um, which will soon be on the AHDB website. So obviously, outdoor crops present much more of a challenge in terms of implementing IPM um, than um, greenhouses and protected crops. So what I'm going to do is just sort of run through some of the, the insect challenges in outdoor crops and be quite selective. So I'm going to talk about aphids, bean seed fly, um, the caterpillars are migrant moths. So that's uh, diamond bat moth and silver wire moth, uh, neither of which can uh, overwinter very successfully in the UK. So they, they usually appear um, sometime in the summer, having um, spent the winter further south. Um, and then a new old pest, um, the Swede midge. And I think the reason why several of these have risen up the agenda is the loss or potential loss of seed treatments. And, and Bruce has alluded to that already. 
Um, and I think that may also be true of Swede midge um, because of uh, the loss of seed treatments in, in, in I guess, all brassicas and, and oilseed rape, um, I'm sure is, a, is one host of Swede midge. Um, before I actually talk about the, the, the pests, um, I just wanted to mention the SEPTA Plus project and, and we've, we've talked about that a bit already. Um, so that focuses on chemical control and biopesticides uh, and, and looking for uh, new, new actives um, against um, target um, pest diseases and weeds in, in a whole range of horticultural crops. Um, and sometimes these are completely new products, but more often they might be products that are new um, to that particular uh, crop or that, that particular pest. So there are a number of emus um, already that have been linked with uh, SEPTA Plus, um, and there are more in the pipeline. Um, and trials relevant to vegetable and salad pests um, have been on aphids, thrips, bean seed fly, asparagus beetle, um, flea beetle, which is going to happen next year, cabbage white fly, similarly next year, and leaf hopper um, in, in herbs. And of course, you'll also be aware that, that in terms of field vegetables and salads, quite a lot of SEPTA Plus resource has gone into um, weed management uh, and also um, disease management as well. So here's the, the first of my uh, the pests that I want to talk about. Um, and these are the pest aphids of um, lettuce. So three, three species. And um, I think for this example, I'll start at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and yesterday, um, at, again, at the aphid event, um, we discussed um, a variety of agronomic practices. And for lettuce, um, we talked about um, some work in California on companion planting for um, control of aphids in organic lettuce. Um, and in this instance, they use sweet allicin um, to attract hoverflies, which then lay their eggs on uh, lettuce plants with aphids. Um, and I also talked in about a bit about host plant uh, resistance. So resistance exists both for current lettuce aphid and lettuce root aphid. Um, and the one for, for lettuce root aphid has been around for about 60 years. Um, both are very effective resistances. Um, the unfortunate thing is because of the, the high selection pressure um, on the particularly related to um, lettuce, current lettuce aphid, um, the, this resistance has, has broken down. Um, there are probably still parts of the UK where um, aphids will succumb to the resistance, but others where um, the aphids just, just overcome it very, very easily. Um, then moving up the pyramid uh, in terms of decision support, um, then there is quite a lot of information available. So um, information from the suction trap network, um, information that we're now taking out from the AHCB potatoes water trap network, um, and there are forecasts for um, both current lettuce aphid and lettuce root aphid in the AHDB pest bulletin. Um, the unfortunate thing about the current lettuce aphid in particular is that it's uh, what we call trap shy, um, so we don't ever catch very high numbers in the suction traps, um, but they are very effective for, for Mises persicae, peach potato aphid. Um, at the event yesterday, we also discussed um, physical control of aphids using nets, and I think the jury's still out. And within Sector Plus, um, we have been screening a number of insecticide and bioinsecticides and identified some potentially useful products. Um, then we've already started talking about um, carrots and aphids and virus. Um, and again, yesterday um, at the aphid event, there was um, discussion about some of the practices at the bottom of the, the pyramid. And I'm going to say a bit more about um, overwintered crops in a minute. Um, again, uh, information for decision support is available from a number of, of sources. Um, and the uh, willow carrot aphids are um, captured well by suction trap and, and water traps. Um, there's a willow carrot aphid forecast in the uh, pest bulletin. And at the moment, there's also an AHDB funded project 
FV460, um, which we're working on in collaboration with, with FERA, um, which is to do with virus transmission um, by aphids and it's focusing on the, their biology and, and therefore the timing of, of treatment. Um, in terms of control, then again, um, willow carrot aphids have been a focus of SEPTA Plus work. And again, we've identified some useful actives. Um, just to flag up that like peach potato aphid, um, willow carrot aphid is also resistant to pyrethroids now, um, so best to avoid them. So, say so I wanted to talk a bit more about willow carrot aphid, and these are the um, a, this is a summary of the suction trap captures of willow carrot aphid for 2020. Unfortunately, there are a few gaps, and that's due to to COVID. Um, but if you look at the um, the area that I've circled in in red, which are two of the sites that caught the highest numbers, um, you can see that high numbers of aphids were flying um, effectively from from mid May to um, mid June. And I guess it's always been thought that these were um, aphids that that came off the the stages that overwintered on on willow as eggs, um, but we have also, um, in recent years at Wellsbourne, um, been following the progress of aphids on our, um, our overwintered carrots. We overwinter carrots for our carrot fly population. Um, and we have recorded um, quite large numbers of aphids building up um, on these plots. And you can see those in the table on the left hand side. Um, and this has also been noticed, I think, this year in particular, um, by carrot growers because quite a number of carrot crops um, were left unstrawed because of the wet the wet winter um, and I think they're aware again that there were large numbers of aphids on some of those um, crops so there is a question now um, about the the implications of of this um, just on the the other side and the photograph here is just a, an overview of the work that we're doing in FV460. Um, and we had a trial at Wellsbourne um, in 2019 uh, where we had plots of carrots and we uncovered um, sets of them for a week at a time. Um, and then um, the level of virus was measured at Ferra. And uh, the results seem to indicate that um, the willow carrot aphid is the main culprit in terms of virus transmission. Um, so again, I'm sorry to keep flagging up the aphids day, but there's just a huge amount of information generated yesterday, um, which will soon be online. Um, so I recommend that if you're interested in biopesticides, uh, resistance or IPM, um, that you, you tune into uh, some of that. Um, I now want to move on to bean sea fly. And again, Bruce has talked about this a bit already. Um, and he's mentioned the cultural control methods and the work PGRO is doing at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, again, we did some work at the top of the pyramid in SEPTA Plus, well, PGRO did a, did a trial. Um, there were no seed treatments, unfortunately, to test, and, and the application was with, with liquid insecticide um, effectively into the furrow, and unfortunately, none of the treatments were, were effective. Um, there's also the possibility of, of, of nematodes, uh, and that's something uh, we're discussing at the moment. Uh, and again, physical um, control might be an option if all else fails. Um, we currently have a, a, a PhD student at, at Warwick, uh, Becca McGowan, and she's doing a, a project funded by AHDB, PGRO and Warwick. Um, and she's particularly focusing on, on trapping, on monitoring and, and hoping to develop a forecast to uh, give better warning of when peak numbers of, of bean sea fly are around. Um, and she's also working on um, cultural control um, as well. So now on to the migrant moths um, and starting with the, the diamond bat moth, which is obviously is a pest of, of brassicas. Um, again, at the top of the pyramid, um, work on insecticides and bioinsecticides was undertaken in, in the SEPTA project prior to SEPTA Plus and in a project uh, FV440. Uh, um, and what we've been focusing on recently 
um, is decision support, which is to give growers better, better warnings um, of when influxes of, of diamondback moths are likely to occur. And some of you may remember that there was a pretty um, large and severe influx of moths in 2016. Um, so particularly what we've been doing is two things. Um, firstly, we've been um, collecting information from, from European websites and from Twitter as well. Uh, there are quite a lot of people out there who, who look for, for moths all the time and report what they see, uh, so citizen science. And then with support from FMC and AHDB, um, there has also been a, a grower um, agronomist pheromone trap network for the last few years. So, so using um, pheromone traps in different parts of the country. And all that information is, is posted on the, the Warwick website because we, we update it pretty frequently. Um, and here are a couple of examples of what happened in, in 2020. So the bigger graph is the, the citizen science information. So you can see there was a, a biggish influx in the middle of June. Um, and then the smaller graph uh, is some information from, from one of the sets of, of pheromone traps. And you can see um, the same peak is reflected in those, in those traps. Um, so trapping is becoming increasingly important. Um, and that's because, partly because CRD's requirement um, for um, emergency applications to, to start um, in 2020 and, and before that uh, was that growers should have caught 25 moths per trap per week. Um, so it's important to be able to demonstrate um, that, that levels have sort of reached that in different parts of the country. Um, and just to say that AHDB will be applying uh, for emergency application again in 2021. Sorry, and that's for, for Benevia, um, that application. Um, and then on to um, silver wine moth, again, another migrant moth. Again, uh, we looked at insecticides and bioinsecticides in SEPTA and FV440. And so far, um, we're not, there's no resistance to pyrethroids. And I forgot to say that, that the moths that have been tested, the diamondback moths that have been tested, um, uh, that have come into the UK, tested by Steve Foster at Rothamsted, have been resistant to uh, pyrethroids. And again, um, what we've done is to um, post citizen science information on the on the website. And this year, there were um, sort of isolated incidents of, of severe damage um, by silver wire moth. And now, finally, I want to go on to um, the last pest, uh, which is the, the new old pest and is Swede midge. Um, and, um, it's a very tiny insect and damage by the larvae um, causes blindness in, in brassica plants. Um, and what we've been focusing on basically in the UK is, is collecting um, more information about its abundance and it, it's, its timing. So again, um, with AHDB support, um, we've set up a pheromone trap, work, a trap network um, with growers just to flag up in terms of management, then it it is a, a new pest in North America. So it, it got to North America fairly recently and has become a huge issue. Um, and the thing that they the things that they most strongly recommend are things at the bottom of the pyramid, um, and particularly rotation and isolation of new crops um, from old crops, which might be sources of the midge. Um, so what happened with our trapping? Um, so first of all, I think we proved that Swede midges are very small and, and I did need to look at all the samples under a microscope. It, it, you just can't hazard a guess. Um, most of the locations had low infestations, but, but it, it, there is a potential for large ones uh, to develop. I don't think we've got enough crop information yet to work out whether there's some sort of threshold um, and damage was reported from other areas where we didn't have traps. And just here are a couple of examples of the, um, the monitoring data from 2020. So uh, you definitely do get um, peaks in abundance. Um, and I think there are probably um, three generations a year, but, but we need to do a bit more work to, to actually um, figure that out and also 
to work out whether um, some of the day degree type forecasts that have been developed elsewhere um, are applicable here. So I just want to talk about the plans for 2021. Um, so the AHD best, best bulletin and the AFID news will be available. Uh, again, we'll be extracting information from the potato yellow water traps on pest aphids of, of vegetables and salads. Um, we'll be monitoring um, the websites for migrant moth sightings. And we're planning to continue uh, with the two pheromone trap monitoring networks. Um, so if you're interested in taking part in those networks, then please contact um, Dawn. And then finally, I'd just like to say thank you to the AHDB team, um, to, the, to the networks, to the suction trap and water traps, uh, to Syngenta for hosting the pest bulletin, um, to the growers, um, and particularly the moth and midge trappers, um, and to the companies supporting uh, Scepter Plus, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rosemary, very much indeed. Um, we are at 19.26, according to my computer, but um, if there are any questions, um, we could just perhaps sneak in a couple of questions, do you think? Well, I'll ask them, but... <laughs> yeah. So, Rosemary, I was just thinking, um, are there any interesting um, things coming out of Europe that um, we could be um, using now? Uh, yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to maintain uh, good links with Europe despite everything. Um, I think, I mean, I've recently been <clears throat> involved in a, in a project that, that Andrew Cuthbertson will know about because uh, DEFRA, DEFRA partly sponsored it, which was on IPM um, for um, root feeding fly pests, so things like cabbage root fly. And <clears throat> there was some very interesting work in France um, looking at managing um, cabbage root fly with, with trap crops and, and potential repellent, repellent sprays. Um, and, um, and then I'm also now, and HDB as well, are involved in an in a, in a EU thematic network called Smart Protect. And in that, we are looking for um, smart methods of managing um, pests and diseases. And uh, we are actually turning up some really, really interesting stuff um, to do good. with monitoring and forecasting. Good, good. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to have to wrap up there. Um, I hope that you found these presentations helpful and we've gone some way to answering your questions. Thank you very much indeed to both of our presenters. Um, just a few reminders before we wrap up. The, before we wrap up the webinar. So if you haven't had a chance to um, complete the forms for BASIS and Nairobi and Neuroso, um, please do send them to my colleague and or likewise to me. If you have any final questions that you may have forgotten to ask, please send them to me also. My address is Dawn Teverson at ahdb.org.uk. Um, the recording and handouts will be uploaded to the AHD Web B website in a couple of days. So, as I say, give it a couple of days and search for AHDB webinars horticulture. I hope that you've enjoyed and benefited from this webinar. It's one of a series of webinars from AHDB Horticulture. And so do, please do keep an eye on our website. And with that, I'll say good evening. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll join us again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, folks.
Maya, are you going to end the webinar? Maya, end the webinar, Maya. It's fruit tea, it's fine. <laughs> Maya. I think she's gone. <laughs> okay. I think quite a few of the attendees have gone as well. There's, yes, there's Maya. a few hanging on in case we say something interesting. Yes, yeah, so there's like ten hanging on. I've got I've got a well done, Bruce from Nigel Kingston. Thank you, Nigel, if you're still there. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> yes, you're still, you're still there. I think Maya just needs to press end webinar and then it will stop recording. Maya, Maya. <laughs>